Welcome back to The Lincoln Project. I'm your host, Reed Galen. Today, I'm joined by Trig Beals, Senior Advisor to The Lincoln Project and President of Viking Strategies, LLC, a Washington, D.C.-based public affairs and political consulting firm. Today, he's coming to us from the great state of Wisconsin. Trigby, welcome back. Thanks for having me on, Reed. It's good to be on. All right, man. Well, it's been a busy couple of weeks, and it's been a while since we've had you on. So let's let's start with a couple of things. One is, um, as of last night, um, as we're recording this, uh, the United States Senate passed their version, uh, or I guess the, the House's version of the debt ceiling deal. Now, as uh, you know, shortly I assume it'll go to the president's desk for his signature. Um, you know, a lot of uh, the the MAGA Republicans were certainly unhappy. So I want to talk about that. A number of Democrats were pretty unhappy, too, with the various policy pieces. But give us your sense of what this means for uh, President Biden, what this means for Kevin McCarthy and what it means for politics in America. Well, I think first and foremost, uh, I'm not sure that we should be giving too many accolades to the United States Senate for doing their most basic of jobs. Right. Like raising the debt ceiling and not screwing around with the reserve currency status of the United States. One of the things foundational things that makes America great and exceptional um, should just be regular business. Um, I think it's good as somebody who leans conservative, albeit who is not a Republican, that um, that there is some spending cuts. I think there's pieces of it that, you know, some of the stuff around defense, I'm not a huge fan of. But uh, on the whole, the fact that both sides on the extremes are complaining about it probably is a really good sign that democracy worked. And um, I think the interesting piece in this is that Joe Biden has been around a long time. Um, he is somebody who, you know, people like when I did stuff in McConnell world, McConnell viewed as a worthy adversary. Um, you know, Joe Biden packed Kevin McCarthy's lunch, really, in yeah. a lot of ways. Um, but he also, he he did what he had to do to get the job done. Um, and sort of like in Ukraine, um, Biden is governing from the center left um, and he's doing it effectively. Right. And, and it's it's interesting, you know, maybe maybe it's it's the it's the curse of America in 2023, Trigby, that when the president does what they're supposed to do, what he's supposed to do and doesn't make a big deal about it right the old reagan thing it's amazing what you can get accomplished if no one's you know if if you know if everyone's willing to you know avoid taking credit or whatever i mangled that but you understand my point is like he just he just figures it out he and his team figure it out uh i heard somebody say he brings everybody into the oval office he sort of lets them all do their sort of ad hominem thing that they need to get out of the way and he says okay now let's get down to work but it's interesting that you know again it's not flash Right. It's it's grinding it out. And maybe that's the years in the Senate that taught him how to do that. I think that's really true. Right. Um, you know, Joe Biden came to the United States Senate. Um, and in this way, he's you know, he's a lot like McConnell and some of the other ones that were slowly losing. Um, they came to the Senate at a time when when you know the Senate had some iconic lion type figures who were willing, they wanted to get things done. They weren't there to be somebody. They were there to do things. Um, and they may have had different perspectives of what those things should look like, but they were willing to work together to get you know, half of what they wanted or a little more than half of what they wanted. And um, that has been Biden's approach. And you know, interestingly, for a while, we haven't had somebody with that kind of background, I would say probably going back to George H.W. Bush was sort of more like Biden um, right. in that way. And um, I think it's really good for the country. I think it's really hard for the country at a moment when we're seeing such political extremism and even radicalization. Um, and we've divided into, you know, three media ecosystems. But on the whole, for Americans, they will benefit from what Joe Biden was able to do both with this package to raise the, the the debt ceiling and and to cut some spending and what he's done previously with you know build back better with what he's doing in Ukraine in terms of standing strong to the Russians um he's just he's getting things done 
what do you think this means for Kevin McCarthy? Remember, it took him back in January, it took him, I think, 15 votes to finally get the gavel. It was these 20, you know, Taliban uh, MAGA Republicans that were really the holdouts. Um, they're the ones who were kicking and screaming on the Capitol steps the other day. Um, <clears throat> but none of them, Trigvi, when asked whether or not they would uh, issue a motion to vacate the chair, which basically means firing McCarthy or at least taking a vote to fire him, none of them would say they'd do that. So have we seen the MAGA caucus cowed? I think in a strange way, Kevin McCarthy for the short term maybe benefits from the fact that all those Democrats voted with him to get this done. Now, they didn't really have much of a choice, right? This was really sane, we're going to raise the debt ceiling as needs to be done versus insane, we're going to go off the cliff and we want chaos. But the reality is in the short term, I think McCarthy probably feels a little safe and that those MAGAs feel a little hesitant um, to try and move to vacate the chair because it's likely that same coalition that just passed the debt ceiling would come together to save McCarthy. I think in the longer term, though, you know, it's only a matter of time be before they move on him. Because they can't help themselves, right? I mean, there's no, I mean, yeah. I guess is there, there's, with these people, is there even a strategy? I mean, you know, I heard somebody the other day, one of the, one of the MAGAs, maybe it was Gates, said, you know, we got so much done in the first five months of the year and this undoes all of it. I'm thinking to myself, like, what did they get done? They passed a bunch of bills that were going to die on the vine. Um, but now it's like they the only thing they have left is sort of retribution, which is sort of their favorite thing anyway. Well, I think I think for him getting things done is is for the Matt Gates sort of wing. It isn't really about tangible accomplishments that make things better for people. Um, it's owning the libs. It's stuff that gets you on right wing in the gets you on TV or podcasts or whatever in the in the new right media ecosystem. Um, that's what getting things that is literally their definition of getting things done. So from his perspective, maybe they have gotten some things done. They haven't been tangible accomplishments. And it kind of, as I'm saying this, I'm thinking about, you know, Tom Nichols, our mutual friend who writes at The Atlantic, has written and is firmly of the belief that the true elites are actually the people in the MAGA wing of the Republican Party. Um, I'm actually thinking, you know, that is, there is a lot of truth to that. I mean, Matt Gates. think about Matt Gates' background, right? Like he comes from a really elite family. It's not like a working yeah. class guy. They haven't gotten anything done for the people who are listening to this podcast. Ironically, they haven't gotten anything done to the people who support MAGA and probably send them money every month online. But to yeah. his end, they probably think they have. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, we we get a lot of questions in the in the podcast mailbox trick me about. And we've we've heard this for years. How come, you know, these these are voters that continually vote against their own interests? Right. And and I think it's always important as a reminder that that their their financial and economic interests really clash with their political beliefs. Right. Which is, you know, they're there to again, to own the libs. Right. To watch people's hair catch on fire, uh, to feel like, you know, maybe their culturally their way of life is still is still got some time left on the clock. Um, even though, you know, that could mean cuts to veterans benefits or entitlements or Medicaid or whatever the case might be. I'm back home now um, in River Falls and in Wisconsin, which is kind of ground zero. Um, I think for a lot of them, you know, it all comes back to a feeling um, and some grievances that those on the left and those on the coast think they're smarter and better than 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 people who aren't that that are part of MAGA, and uh, and so they feel looked down upon. And those things, you know, when they see an opportunity to push back, um, that that's more important to them than you know a twenty five cent increase in the minimum wage or whatever. And in fact, some of the things that sometimes get proposed only further exacerbate that resentment that they hold but but let's i mean let's think about this because you mentioned the elites i mean you know donald trump went to wharton right he's a 
I, at least on paper, or at least on whatever, whatever, uh, you know, dry erase board he's got in his office. He's a billionaire. Um, Ron DeSantis went to Yale and Harvard. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of these guys, right? Cruz is a double Ivy leaguer. Um, uh, Holly went to, to Stanford and I think Yale, right? So, I mean, these guys, they're all, they're all cynical, right? I mean, none of them, I mean, Trump, it's his belief is a different thing. We'll get to that, but the rest of these guys know what they're doing, right? Then they're just happy to continue to just drip that poison into, into the people they think they think are rubes, right? Look, you may have, there may be some truth to the idea that elites in LA and San Francisco and New York and DC look down on what they see as rubes in the, in flyover country. But it's the same as you mentioned for, you know, the Matt Gates of the world. This guy's a very, you know, he's the sign of a, a hugely wealthy guy, right? He doesn't need this. He does it for his own aggrandizement and they're dragging tens of millions of Americans along with him. Well, it's interesting that you say that. So I was out on Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I don't know, days are bleeding together, but I got together with a bunch of my buddies and we went out and had a few beers, ate some cheese curds, went to this awesome place called the Emporium, at least for a Wisconsin guy, it's an awesome place. I don't know how the East Coast people would think about it, but, but it's a, it's a hole in the wall. And, um, we were, we were, and I, I bet Trump won that bar 90, 10. Um, but you know, they were all wanting to, uh, they're all wanting to talk about politics and, and mostly I was listening and they were asking questions about DeSantis and, you know, and, and one of them said something that I hadn't really thought about. He had voted for Trump in 16. And when I asked him about that, I knew he had done that, but I had never really asked him about it. And he said, here's the thing in 16, my take, what his take was Hillary Clinton's a scumbag. I know that. Donald Trump could be one, but I don't know. Right. And he's like, Donald Trump turned out to be worse than Hillary Clinton. And I was wrong. I voted for Joe Biden. He likes Joe Biden. He thinks Joe Biden's doing an okay job. He thinks Joe Biden's old. He still hates Donald Trump, still thinks Trump's a scumbag. So what's he what's he sitting there thinking? He's like, oh, what do you think about DeSantis? Is he, can't we find somebody who isn't? So, and he's a ban in line voter. He voted for for Tony Evers, probably voted for Ron Johnson. Um, he's the kind of guy who's going to decide this election. And in truth, what they're looking for is somebody who is, you know, economically leans conservative, is socially tolerant and 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 moderate on cultural issues. He's got a daughter. Um, he doesn't like the fact that Dobbs has been overturned and abortion is illegal in the state, even though his daughter is 12. Um, and, and that's really what's going on. And, and, and I think he, you know, he's, he likes to go out hunting. The rhetoric from both sides is, is turning him off and they're just, they're looking around. And I think, you know, when I asked him, will you vote for Biden or Trump? It's Biden and Trump. Cause that's what it's going to be. It's like, well, I'll vote for Joe Biden. I think. Right. That that's the battle that's really going on here. And, um, and when I explained to him that Ron DeSantis is a Yale guy and DeSantis' background, he's like, God, he sounds like an even bigger scumbag than than Hillary. So, right. you know, well, and, they're and, lost. And, and um, just based on the videos I've seen out of New Hampshire and Iowa in the last couple of days, Trigby, you know, the two early states, um, <clears throat> You know, just as a just as a detour quickly on DeSantis as is just a candidate. Right. And not not anything else about him. This is not a guy who looks like he's having any kind of fun. Right. And running for president is not fun. I don't think it's supposed to be fun. Um, but you can certainly tell the people who are willing to sort of grit their teeth and suck it up on the retail politicking front, because every Iowan believes that they deserve to take their measure of the man or woman who's running. And certainly every New Hampshireite does too, right? Because they're such small retail states. And he's just flinty and annoyed. And, you know, may, maybe it's like, okay, there's enough, there's enough Iowans and enough, you know, folks on the seacoast in New Hampshire to, to pull a guy like that over the line. But, you know, I remember doing an event where Rand Paul was uh, on a panel years ago, right? And he said, yeah, this is, I think it must've been 2015. And I said, and he said, you know, and I could tell you, it's just not a lot of fun. Right. And that's exactly what I see from DeSantis, which is if you can't even pretend like you're having a good time, 
right, um, that you're happy to be there. Uh, there's an awful lot of distance between you as a candidate and that, you know, one of 33,000 caucus goers you need to pull, you know, to to fill in the sheet for you sometime in January at a snowy church. Well, I mean, it's funny because guys like you and I can go on and on about stuff like this. He is not a happy warrior. Mm. And say what you want about Trump, but Trump, to his base, comes across as a happy warrior. Now, to the rest of America, he comes across as mean and cynical and all the rest of it. But to the people that that like his comedy, for lack of a better term. The show. You right, know, the, they the show. love it. They love the show. And um, DeSantis... Listen, you and I have been around enough politicians that you know pretty fast if they're the kind who can go out and do the retail that you need to do in places like Iowa and New Hampshire right. to get through. And, and you have some like John McCain who could just do enough of it in 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 New Hampshire to, to make it happen. I mean, the truth of the process is you have those first three states where you got to do retail and then it's all a momentum play. Um, Ron DeSantis... I mean, you think about George W. Bush, right? Like he liked going out and interacting with people. He genuinely liked people, was interested in people. Listen, I remember um, the first the first event I did for him in Iowa in Sioux City in nineteen in the summer of nineteen ninety nine, right? We did a picnic. Must have been four or five hundred people there. And he stayed and he shook every last hand that wanted to shake his, right? Took pictures, smiled, made jokes, slapped the backs, right? you know, thunderstorm looming, schedule shot to hell. Um, you know what? And we, when the last person was headed to their car, he got back in the motorcade and headed for the airport. And I bet he was happy about it. And, you know, Bill Clinton, you know, could, could work a crowd like that and would stay there and do it. Um, right. You know, Newt Gingrich, quite frankly, some of the success he had in Iowa, like he was really good at that. Ron DeSantis does not seem to be a guy who wants right. to do any of that. He is going to end up being a lot more like Scott Walker, I think, yeah. where he will he comes across as does as did Scott as just a guy who really wants to be. And I, you know, I will say this. I, I actually think part of Trump's appeal, if we really peel back the onion, was that he wasn't seen. Yes, he wanted to be. But for people who are backing him in the show. He was not seen as much as a guy who wants to be as he was a guy who wants to do and 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 was doing it. And what they perceived him as doing was give the middle finger to the people that make them angry. And so right. it had nothing to do with policy. Right. Kind no, of it to was, where I we mean, he was this I, mean, I mean, he is still the you know, the the alpha and the omega of the theoretically the middle finger to the establishment. Right. Correct. Um, of, of both the Republican and the Democratic parties. Um, the difference is, I think, in the Republican Party, the establishment hasn't had much purchase since he showed up, you know, eight years ago. And in the Democratic Party, the establishment wing is still much larger and in control. But let's talk about Trump for a second. So, you know, even for him, Trigby, in the in, in the last, I don't know, month or two, maybe it's the last month since his CNN town hall, you know, for all of the, you know, discussion of Trump running the the quote unquote discipline campaign with people like Chris Lasavita, who we've mentioned, and Susie Wiles, who we've mentioned. It doesn't appear it appears that the more disciplined they try to be, and this is maybe the just the natural being of Trump, they can't out discipline his crazy operationally. Right. And he just seems to have really decided that, you know what, all bets are off. Maybe it's because he has opposition, even if he's not terribly worried about it. But, you know, on a Fox News town hall as, last night as we're recording this, right, insanity about Russia and Ukraine and Iran. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, you know, he he's always been out to lunch on serious issues. But now it's like he lives on frickin' Pluto. Yeah, I don't, uh, you know. None of which prevents him from being the Republican nominee. Let me just put that out there. No, he will. He will. I mean, you as you know, and as we'll have coming out uh from the lincoln democracy institute like we've looked into this pretty in detail you know donald trump barring some unforeseen uh will be the nominee and when i say unforeseen i don't even mean indictments because he has got um his support is wide and deep and there are some real strategic challenges for somebody who would be 
trying to take him out. But that isn't the question. I'm trying to think of it in terms of how autocratic personalities act when they don't have exactly what they want. They kind of act like the way Putin is acting, right? Which is they're all over the map. Uh, one day they're threatening Armageddon and the next day, you know, they're hanging out with kids. Um, meanwhile, their troops are killing kids or abducting kids. Um, I think there's a little bit of that going on with Trump, right? Like he isn't really sure what he should be doing. So he's throwing as much shit at the wall to see what sticks. Mm. And meanwhile, he's got this discipline campaign, which Chris and Susie are running for him. Um, so it's kind of by the media and others perceived as well, you got Chris and Susie and, you know, as you know, I mean, Chris Lasavid is a really fun guy if you're a reporter to go have a drink with. He's a really fun guy to go have a drink with no matter who you are, right? Um, and I say this, people on the left might say, how can you be friends with these people? To be honest, if you went and hung out with Chris Lasavida and listened to him tell stories and listen, he list, was listening to yours, you would be like, you know. But that said, um, so the reporters are kind of covering it well. It's a different Trump. But meanwhile, you have Trump just throwing stuff out there to see what sticks. And those two are going to collide at some point, though, because they're two different realities. And, and they are both occurring simultaneously, but they cannot continue to occur simultaneously in the big arc of things. Right. If that so, makes sense. Yeah. So I'm, I'm interested in, in Trump in the eyes of, you know, the well, the National Review crowd, right? They've never liked him. They got in line when he was president because they had to. Now they've decided that Ron DeSantis is the guy. There was a, um, you know, everybody's least favorite elf, Ben Shapiro, was doing an interview with somebody the other day where he was talking about, you know, why he, I think he's a DeSantis fan, but he's like, Trump, you know, increased the debt by eight trillion you know, lockdowns, he's got, you know, he can't get reelected. He's got terrible numbers with, you know, communities of color. He's got terrible numbers with women. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, that's, is that just like them doing this now because they're DeSantis fans or like, will they, will they continue that even when Trump is the nominee? Because they're sort of making our case, Trig v. Forrest, they're certainly, I think, making the president's case for why Trump shouldn't be president again so what's what's the play there is it just like they figure this is their time this is the window when they can say what they want and then they'll get back in line say in march of next year i think it's a little bit like star wars like those guys you know the rebels became the empire and, and ben shapiro and jenna ellis and the rest of these people who are caitlin you know caitlin mcenany or whatever the hell her name is like they actually think that that primary voters, Republican primary voters who are leaning towards Trump, give a flying fuck what they think. They don't care. But in the same way that a bunch of elites thought when Trump was running in 15 and 16, that they could come out and people would care. They, I don't know. I just think it's ego, right? I mean, how many primary voters who are, who are locked in on Trump in Iowa are going to really care what Ben Shapiro say to him. They listen to Ben Shapiro, they, but all they get is mad at Ben Shapiro when he says that stuff, Jenna Ellis. It's the same as Fox, right? Like these guys, they actually think they're running things, but in the end, they will just go back to what makes them money. And that's why in re and what will make them money is being loyal to Trump. Now, the question is, will Trump take them back once they've demonstrated disloyalty? Well, if well, we know this is like many good people. Maybe he'll never trust them. I don't know that he trusts anybody. But if they publicly bend the knee and kiss the ring, he'd be happy to take them back because it's that abasement, right? It's that public display of of fealty that he just relishes probably as much as anything. It's likely the I dominated, you know. Right. There's a dominance. Um I am, I'm the alpha. Right. Um, but, you know, I, I just think, you know, <laughs> I mean, it is kind of funny to watch these people twist around. Well, and, you know, that's right? the thing, too, is, is we're talking about the, the I'm going to call it, I guess it's what passes for conservative intelligentsia. But, you know, it's amazing. And, you know, I, I actually 
Trig V, forgive me. I actually spent a few minutes listening to um, Josh Holmes's podcast at right after <laughs> right after DeSantis. The useless launched. podcast. Yeah, right after DeSantis launched last week, yeah, as we're recording useless. this, it was interesting to hear them. Which is, you know, their their professional hats were on for about the first ten minutes of the conversation about, um, you know, the the Elon Musk, you know, debacle on Twitter, and then you know. Elon Musk and and set this guy Sachs, right? You know, like this is not. Oh yeah, David is, Sachs. David Sachs is not good retail politics, but then they're like, but his depth of knowledge on policy issues, you know, he just knows everything from stem to stern. And I was like, do you after at long last after all this, you guys still think it's about policy? You still think that matters? And I was, I don't know if it's naivete or you know, willful ignorance. I don't know, Trigger, but I was sort of surprised. Like, I'm not surprised that they don't like Trump because Trump causes nothing but trouble, right, for them. And it and he prevents them from running the world as they want to. But I was surprised that, like, this is where they were coming from, which was somehow anybody thinks, one, that I don't know if Ron DeSantis has policy chops, but two, that, like, any of that stuff will matter because the truth is even in Florida, you know, it's all culture war stuff, right? We're going to... We're going to, you know, we're going to get rid of wokeism. I mean, you know, DeSantis goes on the air and says, you know, we're going to eradicate leftists, right? Um, you know, whether or not it's a stupid fight with Disney that, you know, Disney is just going to grind him down on or, you know, excising African-American history. These are not policy chops. These are culture war chops. Yeah, that, it is. That's interesting. I mean, I find it as you're as you're saying that I didn't listen, obviously, to the useless podcast, but um the um you know it, it's iron it's ironic that somebody like josh who is who has really spent a career in in some ways i don't know that he's a pioneer but he certainly was one of the early adapters to the whole republican process of building narratives you know that that every politics was about building narratives it wasn't about policy um you know that's what they're left with now because Trump has built these narratives. DeSantis isn't demonstrating the ability. So now we're going to pivot back to, well, it's really about policy. And in reality, what we kind of to your point, there's no policy to stand on because DeSantis has spent all his time building narratives. So whatever the policy chops are, are just narratives that have been built. This is interesting. So, you know, in the last few days, you know, um, Josh Hawley's, you know, tried to express his version of masculinity, which I talked about on the last episode. Um, and there's been a lot of very interesting and I think very compelling writing from, you know, people who consider themselves non-Republican conservatives like yourselves, like yourself. They're now calling the, the wingers, the MAGA people are now saying that Chick-fil-A is too woke. Right. So Disney's too woke. Chick-fil-A is too woke. They're in a fight with NASCAR because NASCAR, you know, came out in favor of Pride Month. Right. Yesterday, June 1st, as we're recording this. I mean, so Trigby, they they don't like women. They don't like people of color. They don't like people different from them. Um, they don't like corporations. Um, who is so are they just literally relying on the angry 18 to 55 year old white guy to get him over the line because i'm not sure you know what else it is they're doing they're alienating just about every other group well what they like is is those who they view as subservient to them right like that's what they like you can just use donald trump as your litmus test of uh, and then apply it out to the others and that is what is donald trump like donald trump likes people who are subservient to him and kiss his ass just as and tell him what he wants to hear. People who are within that autocratic vertical, all of whom are the people that you're talking about, like Josh Hawley, who are angling within it, um, it's the same thing. Like that's anybody who stands up to them is a threat to them because they're not acquiescing to power. This is a zero sum game. It's for them, it's power. And so, you know, Josh Hawley. <laughs> Honestly, that guy's never, you and I had this conversation offline. That guy has never been in a fist fight in his life. And right. you can usually tell the people that haven't been in fights when they're trying to masquerade as tough guys. Ted Cruz is another one. Like, honestly, Reed, we talk about it when in those, in those 2015 debates, 
if any of those guys, when Trump was talking about their wives, had gone over and stomped his ass, which is right. what you or I would do if somebody talked about our wives the way he was, and most of our listeners would, they would have demonstrated, first of all, they'd have been the Republican nominee. Second of all, they've probably gotten elected president. Third, they would have demonstrated that, like, how you confront somebody like that, a bully. And, um, but Josh, the Josh Hollies of the world, honestly, that's not who they are. Because right. they just, you know, they don't stand for anything really other than themselves. How long can you keep that act up, Trigby? I mean, how long does that really with with voters? Because, right, I mean, I really and I said this on the last episode that I recorded, because I do think that v politics is downstream of culture, as we've said for many years. But like how many people take Josh Hawley seriously amongst the MAGA set or the Republican set? The hair is too perfect, Right. Like, I mean, he is not a product of central Missouri, right? He is a product no. of McLean, Virginia, right, uh, where he lives now, and he's basically always lived, um, and private schools and St. Paul's in England. And, you know, Trump is different because he'll do and say anything, right? And he, he, he is the id for a lot of these people. But for guys like Cruz and Hawley and some of the others, they're so blatantly transparent. Does it does it does it really work for them? I think honestly, with like no, I don't think it really does work for them, right? Like I think ironically, like the guys, <laughs> all the people who were at the Emporium, um, who would be, you know, as I said, that place voted 90-10 Trump, you know, like you guys like you and I can walk into a room and we start analyzing, all right, this this crowd 6040 right. or whatever um but it was 90 10 people that are in that bar they look at those guys and they see frauds that's what right. they see donald trump is different because he speaks their language and and to them he is he is given the middle finger he is he is he is standing up you know but no, they don't. And and to them, you know, the testicle tanning of Tucker Carlson and all the rest of that stuff, um, that isn't that isn't their version of masculinity. Right. Um, their mass their version of masculinity is you know is hanging out with their their buddies and being a loyal friend and being a loyal husband and you know living living the life that they want to live. And occasionally, you know, if one of their buddies or or their wives when they were younger is taking crap or some other even lady just out of principle taking crap from somebody going over and confronting those people right and they don't see josh holly or ted cruz as people who do that no well holly ran away right literally ran away ran for right. his life on january 6th and as you noted cruz let trump make fun of his wife repeatedly and now you know is a simp for the guy so i think that you know right. we, we know who these people are and i think again to your point even the maga folks who they so desperately need uh, no a fraud. And I think that's the difference too. just think about the Republican Party broadly, why there is Trump, who is the leader of the movement, <clears throat> as well as the leader of the party. And the rest of them are different, which is, is he a politician? Sure, by dint of the fact that he's served as the president of the United States. But I want to I want to say he was president of the United States, I wouldn't say he served. Um, and the rest of them are just politicians. Right. And I think that's right. the one, you know, the dividing line between him and the rest of the Republican field, such as it is, is, you know, he plays the game because he knows it instinctually. Right. It comes out of him naturally. The rest of them right. have to do it um, performatively. And, and a lot of the folks you see, you know, watching that know that. And I think that's why you've seen even in the in the week or so since you know, DeSantis has launched in the recent surveys that came out right after, you know, the snap polls, like he hasn't gotten a bump for getting in the race, right? And may no. very well never do that. And and if there's going to be any gaining of ground against Trump, it will probably be because people peel away from Trump a few here and there, rather than, um, you know, somebody making a case. Because here's the other part, too, as we start to wrap up, Trigby, is with the exception of DeSantis, none of them, I mean, None of them have said what they want to do for the American people, right? Getting rid of wokeism is not a policy plan, right? That's not even a that's not even a vision. That's just a that's a talking point. And even even the MAGA folks know that, right? None of them, right. and they all have to eventually say Donald Trump was a bad president, right? Right. He's bad for the country. He's bad for the party. 
I have a different vision. The problem is either DeSantis has the same vision. It's just like running it through Google Translate, right? It's, it's the same words, but it's not the same language in some ways. And mm -hmm. the rest of them are too afraid to take him on anyway. If you look at what DeSantis is doing, it's, a, it's, a, it's an appeal. He's trying to run to the right of Trump, but they get people all whipped up on these things and then they disappear war on christmas right like to me i mean i just don't know like it it becomes hard to know if any of these are real things is is <laughs> in sports across america are women high school athletes being defeated at state tournaments and track by people who are identifying i you know they find one example and that becomes the the thing it, it, yeah, so I don't know how you build around that because at the end of the day, Trump does have the overarching narrative. I'm giving the finger to these people. And right. all the rest of that conforms into the narrative, whereas these guys are just creating a bunch of narratives. and Right, and you know. hoping that, you know, and hoping that a, a bunch of plutocrats come and fund a super PAC to keep them going, you know, through Iowa or right. New Hampshire or whatever. All right, Trigby, before we let you go, give us give us some one thing that that you're looking at that uh, that, you know, we haven't heard yet today. I have been spending quite a bit of time recently, as you know, focused on um, Wisconsin because uh, I've been back here and and uh, obviously Wisconsin is going to be pivotal. It is going to be a really interesting summer because coming in August, obviously, the Supreme Court will tip based on the last elections and Protosevich will be on board. Um and that has big repercussions nationally. If you're listening in California, you think, why do I care about this? Well, you care about it because ultimately, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Arizona are going to decide the presidential elections. Um, there, there's going to be a whole lot of, of things that have been built up. You know, abortion is currently illegal in the state of Wisconsin. There's gerrymandered maps. Um, there's going to be a real set of changes here that are going to set off some things that will impact our presidential politics and our national politics moving forward. Um, so I think that's kind of the under the radar thing that I've kind of been focused on, because quite frankly, you know, the stakes, as you know, with Lincoln Project, you know, most of my time is spent on four states, five right. states. That's what I've been following. No, and we're certainly glad you are. And before we let you get out of here, where can folks find you online? You can find me online at Trig V Olson, T R Y G V E O L S O N on um on Twitter. And you can also find me. I'm on once a week. Now I'm gonna be on statewide on uh, civic media.us across the state of Wisconsin on the Todd Albaugh show. And I think it's gonna be one o'clock on Wednesdays. So listen, if you if you live in the great state of Wisconsin or you want to listen online, do both of those things every week. Um, also, gang, before I let you go, I want uh, we are launching today. We are launching our Take Back the Flag initiative. You can go to our website, LincolnProject.us, to any of our social channels and see that. I think that too many of us have been afraid to fly a flag on their homes. If that's you, right, it is not. MAGA's flag. It is not Trump's flag. It's not a Republican flag. It is as much your flag and my flag and Trigby's flag as it is anybody else. If you are flying your flag, and I hope you are, as I am today, I would love it if you take a picture, a quick video, send it to info at lincolnproject.us. Tell us what the flag means to you and why you're flying it, right? Again, hashtag take back the flag, guys. Again, that flag belongs to all of us, and let's make sure everybody knows that. As always, you can find me on Twitter and TikTok at Reed Galen, on Instagram at Reed, Gal Reed underscore Galen underscore LP. Trig V. Olson, thanks for joining me. Thanks again to everyone for listening. Be sure to follow and subscribe to The Lincoln Project on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or however you listen. Don't forget to leave a five-star review. To connect with us, follow us on Twitter, at Project Lincoln, and for more information on our movement, to join our mailing list, subscribe to our newsletter, or make a contribution to our efforts, visit lincolnproject.us. If you want to message the podcast directly, please send an email to podcast at lincolnproject.us. And if you want to personally join the fight to save our nation's democracy, visit join the Union. Dot us. For The Lincoln Project, I'm Reed Galen. 
I'll see you on the next episode.